as the market was coming off the 2000 highs, they cut rates, market collapsed. So everybody who's now cheering in the US, oh boy, they just cut rates, oh boy. Uh-uh, historically it's not a good idea because when they cut rates, they're panicked. We think that there's a good reason for them to panic. When that bubble breaks, all kinds of errors will be exposed. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SPTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira, part of the outreach team of Silver Bullion here in Singapore, where we want to help you truly secure your wealth. Michael Oliver from Momentum Structural Analysis joins us today. Michael has a wealth of expertise and knowledge working for decades at high-level positions in the financial and commodity space. And he is also the author of The New Libertarianism, Anarcho-Capitalism, A Marriage of the Concepts of Ayn Rand and Murray Rothbard. And we're delighted to have Michael join us once again today. It's time to saddle up and silver up for Michael Oliver. Michael, welcome back to SBTV. How are you doing? Good to be back, Patrick. Doing fine. Interesting times. Yeah, great to have you back. It's 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 been a while, and the the world has definitely changed since the last time we spoke. Um, I saw uh, on YouTube on another YouTube channel where you you stated, and I hope in the day of AI and all this fakery going on that this was you, where you had said, literally, I have never seen in my career such macro, technical, and fundamental events underway that the chief beneficiary area of which should be gold and silver and the miners. Can you break this down a bit for us and, and walk us through your view stated here? Okay. Well, it's, a, it's really an issue ongoing over the past century, Federal Reserve, okay, where you get these boom-bust cycles, in, especially in the stock market. And it's usually directly connected to monetary activities by the Fed, both the artificial interest rate levels that they create and river flows of, of liquidity. And quite often investors will flow that river into the stock market. <clears throat> now there's times they won't, and it, it's a, that's something people need to realize. But we think that the bubble that was just created, stock market bubble, in the U.S. in particular, is the biggest in U.S. history in terms of one, age of the bull market, and two, the dimensionality of it. For the NASDAQ 100 over the, since 2009, a lot of years there, 18-fold gain. For S&P 500, seven-fold plus gain. You go back and look at 1923 to 29, 1994 to 2000, 2000 uh, yeah, 2002 low to the 2007 high in the U.S. Those were doubles and triples, and they lasted a handful of years. So they were both shorter and less dimension. Therefore, the embedded distortions that have occurred during the bubble uh, are worse. Will be worse, and once they get, once the bandage gets ripped off, the pain will start to flow. A lot of the errors that are committed aren't just macro errors; they're they're family type errors. They're municipal government type errors, company errors, where spending decisions, commitments to do this or do that, build a new home, uh, add to the factory, hire more workers, et cetera, et cetera, are based on variables. But one of the main variables in anybody's decision process is what is the cost of money? That's a major factor. And if money is effectively free for a dozen years, you know, it had one little blip with the Fed funds rate went from like zero up to 2.3, and then they yanked it right back down again. We call this filling the tank, which the Fed is filling the tank with liquidity, and the primary beneficiary was the stock market, especially the U.S. stock market, more so than any other, certainly more than China, more than, more than Europe, and so forth. So we have the biggest bubble. <clears throat> so far, when you look at the price chart, most people don't perceive that it's broken. Our analysis, momentum analysis, suggests that in January of 2022, it broke. But most topping processes in the stock market, when you go back through history, uh, well, we take the 2000 top. We got bearish in January of 2000. It didn't fall apart till January 2001. Labored up there, even made marginal new highs above when we said sell. 2000, 
late 2006, the market was starting to top. Um, if you've ever seen the movie The Big Short, you know, the guys who anticipated what was going to happen fundamentally in the real estate market were right, but they didn't know how to time it. In late 2006, we could see that the market was going to top the next year, and we forecasted that the high would be probably between 1550 and 1600, which was an all time new high for the S&P if, if it got there. It had still been confined below the 2000 top. Well, it labored all year long, 2007, up and down, up and down, and then finally punched through that high. The Fed had cut rates in mid-September of 2007. The first rate cut in years, by the way, back then. Market top four weeks later. If you, if, in other words, if you'd shorted when the Fed cut rates, you nailed the top. Same occurred in 2001, January 2001, as the market was coming off the 2000 highs, they cut rates, market collapsed. So everybody who's now cheering in the US, oh boy, they just cut rates, oh boy. Uh-uh, historically it's not a good idea because when they cut rates, they're panicked. Uh, anyway, we think that there's a good reason for them to panic. When that bubble breaks, all kinds of errors will be exposed in all kinds of arenas, not just in the stock market. And because of the dimensionality of the bubble, the consequences should be huge. I think gold knows that. I think back then, uh, the Fed, we had so many zombie companies, you know, still, still alive. Uh, the Fed was really keeping companies alive, just, just liquidity going in all over the place. Um, and you said that there were mistakes making. So I, I want to just move over a little bit into the, the bond market. You see some mistakes going on in there also? Well, we had an event last year, which we called, it was the summer of last year now, I'm talking, T-Bond futures market we were looking at, uh, it's 30-year maturity, uh, which is the, the end of the market that the Fed has least control over. Now, they have more control over the very short term, the overnight stuff. But the way long end of the market, they, they have some influence, but they don't have total control. And we could see there was a crash coming. We called it a nuke event. And sure enough, between... August and October of last year, the T-bond market went down savagely, speedily, almost crash-like. In fact, it went down where other bond markets, like let's say corporate debt, municipal bonds, they went down too, but they didn't go down in crash-like dimensions. So you, what does that do to the Fed? Well, and, and to Secretary of Treasury, panic. Now they can't admit panic, because you do that, then you enhance the panic, okay? But you know they were panicked. And we expected a V bottom at that point, meaning that yields would peak, prices would bottom in T-bonds and we'd rally. We did, rallied like a little ballistic rocket ship coming up out of the hole into December. Nice move. Then it halted and now we've been in an arm wrestling pullback. The question is, what's next? If the T-bond market can rally about four or five points, not, not yield points, but price points, Right now, we're trading in the 117s on T-bond futures. You get up in the mid-122s, and you're going to break them out on our momentum work, meaning yields will drop. Question is, when is that going to occur, and is there more pain, meaning somewhat higher yields, lower prices before then? Can't answer that right now. But I can say they do have the potential to turn up. Now, what does that mean? As you know, there's a 60-40 portfolio rule. You know, if you own 60% stocks, balance it with 40% bonds. So, well, that, that, you got killed in 2022 if you had that portfolio. In fact, T-bonds were down more than the stock market was. But historically, there is, for instance, in 2007, when the stock market peaked, started down, bonds took off upside, yields dropped. Gold took off too then. Similarly, in 2001, when the stock market started to really start its bear trend, Bonds turned up and price down and yields gold went up. So T-bonds and gold were sort of in link at those points in time. And what it means is that some asset managers saw that the risk in stocks, too high, too risky. Let's move some portfolio percentages over to an alternative. And the alternative was perceived at those times as T-bonds, uh, debt market. And it was right. Okay. This time it may be right too, but I don't think it's going to be sustainable right, meaning if, if there is a fracturing of the stock market that people recognize, in, in meaning in price, 
There's already nervous portfolio managers out there. We hear them. Yet they're long. They have to be. You can't not be long. You lose customers if the market's going up. So they're long, but they're doubtful. You can bet when that market wobbles, we expect it to commence very soon, price-wise. Give back the, quote, marginal new highs that a few indices have made. Most market indices have it, but the S&P and Dow have. At that point, you're going to have some movement over into two categories. We're already seeing one of them right now. That's the gold market and the gold miners, by the way. But I think you could also see it at some point in the T-bonds, meaning a drop in yields. But it's simply a function of panic, looking for a better place to be. If you're enjoying this interview with Michael Oliver and I, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel. And did you know that at Silver Bullion, there are six different types of accounts to fit your needs? To find out more, go to www.silverbullion.com.sg, click on the signups tab, and choose from these six types of accounts. Or email me at patrick at silverbullion.com.sg, and I'll help get you started. The market, is it going to be just a, a free fall altogether? Or would, would we be looking at maybe certain sectors first that we would see start to fall? Well, the leadership on the upside has obviously been the technology sector. Okay. And now lately AI. Okay. And that's why the NASDAQ 100, which is focused in that area, has gone up way more than the S&P 500 over the, since 2009. Okay. Sevenfold versus 18-fold. So it will lead on the downside in terms of percentage decline. But there also, it will be broad. It will not be narrow. In other words, if the market goes down, it's going down. It won't just be tech sector. So people who think, I'll go over to this sector and be okay, no, uh, no the, the whole thing's going to go. Uh, the only question is which sectors go more. Uh, we know that last year, for example, the banks spooked many people. We had, a, we had a little crash in the bank sector, the U.S. banks. That would be March of last year. Uh, and that's sort of gone by the way, and, you know, the banks have stabilized. They're not back at their highs. Okay. S&P may be because of a few stocks in the S&P, and same with NASDAQ, you know, about 5% above its old highs. But a lot of sectors aren't, the banks aren't. But, you know, so everybody's sort of watching the banks. I think they should broaden their view. Uh, there's other sectors out there that, from our technical, unique technical perspective, show pending vulnerability uh, and surprising type vulnerability, meaning when they start to break, they could break quickly and deeply. Uh, one of them, for example, is the healthcare sector. It's a sector that very few people are looking at as being vulnerable. So, and that's the kind of stuff that happens. That's when people get panicked because they didn't expect it. There could be a liquidity crisis coming up, perhaps a, a currency crisis coming up, uh, a fiat currency crisis coming our way. If, if, if that should happen, is or are there any good fiat currencies that, that we could look at for shelter? I wouldn't look at any currency. Yes, they compete with each other. Uh, and, they, you know, the dollar is up versus the euro. And therefore, the, recently, the dollar index has been up. The dollar index is a meaningless concept. It's 57.6% euro. It's hardly an index, okay? It's, it's a euro inverted, okay? Uh, it's, the, it's the degradation of the money units in general. And if you look at an M2 chart of the, uh, on the Federal Reserve site in St. Louis, go back 50 years or so, basically every decade, the money supply almost doubles. Almost, regardless of the decade, regardless what happened that decade, the money supply basically doubles every decade. What does that mean? It means your buying power you know, gets w wiped out every decade. So if you bought a stock at $10 and 10 years later it's at 20 and you think you're making money, no, you're not. Okay. Uh, when I was a little kid, a loaf of bread was under 20 cents. You know, what is it now? Okay. Uh, so it's a degrada ongoing degradation of money. But I think what gold sees here and, and what it's done over the, over the, since it was legalized in the U.S., you know, went from 30 something to 200, then to 850, then to 1920, and now we're 2350. Why does it keep going up? Because money continues to degrade. But the question now is if you break that bubble, paper asset bubble that we just talked about, the Fed will panic. You know, they may say, oh, well, fighting inflation. Well, they're going to have a real problem there because, yes, the Bloomberg Commodity Index, for example, is starting to reassert itself again. And I think we're starting a second leg up in commodities. So presumably the Fed would therefore do what? Maintain higher rates, not cut. Of course, the stock market doesn't want that. But if the stock market starts to break, there's the other thing that the Fed has, the other mandate, and that's employment. 
And employment numbers, frankly, have not looked good. Which all the last three or four months, they keep showing these, oh, job growth is great, but it really isn't. It's part-time. It's in healthcare and home care services. It's in hospitality. And it's especially in government hiring. So all the main sectors of the economy are flat to down in terms of employment. So it's really getting, but once that data point changes, the Fed will be pressured two different directions. And I almost guarantee you, they'll panic to defend the paper assets. In which case, what does that mean? That means any tightness we may have seen over the last, since March of 2022, is gone. They're going back to loose policy. That's what gold lives on. And gold knows it's coming. Well, speaking of gold, um, you've noted that in the last 50 years, there have been three gold bull markets, uh, 1970 to 75. There was about a, a sevenfold move that came out of it. 76 to 80, there was an eightfold move that came out of that. And, and there was a long period from 1999 to 2011 where there was another eightfold move. Michael, do any of these periods remind you of what we are seeing today? Yeah. The gold bull trend right now is about eight years old. It started from the 2015 low, so it's got some maturity to it, but it's only doubled plus. Okay. And as you've noted, over the last 50 years, we've had uh, sevenfold and two eightfold moves. And we have the background technicals and fundamentals now that would justify at least that much, if not more. But if you go back and examine those bull markets, you'll find that much of the explosion came in the tail end of the bull markets, the last year of the bull markets. And I think we're now at that point. We've crossed enough what we call annual momentum technicals. We, we, don't, we plot price like everybody else does. But we plot price in its relationship to, for example, a three-year average or 36-month average to get a long-term vista of the momentum. And we get a totally different picture than when you look at a price chart. We just broke out of a massive multi-year horizontal range <clears throat> that's evident both on the, on the miners. They've been going down in price the last three years, remember. Silver, which has been eroding for the last three years, not collapsing, just eroding from $30 down to, the, you know. But it had a flat structure as well on its annual momentum. And gold did too. They've all broken out. When this happened before, and there's a couple prior times in history where we can look back and see that technical event occurred. It was usually at the tail end of the bull market or at the very outset of the bull market, not in the middle. And when you cross that threshold on momentum, you launched. And usually the launch would last a couple quarters, five to seven months. And it was explosive. And particularly it was explosive for the miners and for silver, where over the years of the bull market, they were keeping up with gold, basically, or lagging it a bit, but not, not dynamic compared to gold. In the last year of the bull market, they went berserk, especially silver. Go back and look at 1979 charts of silver and compare it to gold, what they did percent-wise. Uh, I think silver is now in that position, and the miners as well, to really launch in a way on a percentage basis much more than gold. And again, if, you know, if we use that eightfold model, and I'm not going to predict, I'm just going to say it did it three times before, and we've got far better justification this time, then, you know, go $8,000 gold, okay? You know, and that's just doing what they did then. Uh, now, if you look at the ratio of silver to gold, that's the other issue. If you go back, now, we measure it differently than most people. We just simply divide the price of silver into gold, and right now, silver is about 1.2% of the price of gold, okay? Pretty low. If you go back over the 50-year period, you'll see numerous times, handful of times, where silver has gone up to 25 to 3% of the price of gold, okay? So it's not like it's, it's extraordinary for it to do that. Right now, silver is vastly undervalued. If it went up to 2 to 2.5% 2 of the price of gold, and you had gold at $8,000, you do the math. Silver's a couple hundred, okay? Uh, even if gold only went to 4000 silver went up to two and a half percent or two percent of the price of gold. It would be massive in terms of the percentage gain of silver versus gold. And we think the technicals have now shifted, favoring that outcome. And so I think the next six months, it's going to be seatbelt time. And I strongly suspect you'll start to hear in the other markets, like the stock market, central bank policy changes, et cetera, et cetera, where you say, aha, they knew it was coming. Gold and silver knew it was coming. 
massive flow of liquidity again. You know, Michael, um, what would be maybe the one or two things that, that you think could be driving the gold market right now? And, and I know you've mentioned the word tectonics. There's a lot of things that, that are going on. Could you help us understand this a bit more? I think it's the anticipation of uh, knowing that what the Fed does and will do and will do again. Uh, it knows that. It knows the Fed can't play this game. Because once the paper asset bubble starts to break, then you're going to get the data points that usually follow the market, don't lead the, the market, like unemployment. So as soon as the Fed has justification in their silly little academic world, uh, where they could say, oh, unemployment, now that's our other mandate, and uh, therefore we're going to have to cut rates. They'll also provide liquidity in various ways. You know, they, they could, like they did, did the COVID epidemic, you know, they came in and they literally bought ETFs, okay, <laughs> just like the Bank of Japan. Uh, so gold knows this, and I think gold knows that the stock market's bubble, and when it breaks, hell's going to break loose in terms of monetary flows. And what is that? That's blood in the veins of, of uh, gold. Period. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree um, with what you're saying about the Fed. I, I'm not sure really what what they can do. I mean, I know they're going to do something, but when you look at, the, let's say, something like oil and how we hear production will soften and, and even Mexico will also slow down uh, either with production or exports. What does the Fed do when food, clothing, electronics, traveling, all these things that come from oil or, or petroleum all start to rise again in price? Yeah. Well, it's going to be a predicament for them because, see, they've got that mandate that says they're fighting inflation. OK, well, right now, the Bloomberg Commodity Index, which is a very good broad index of commodities, it topped one month after the Russia-Ukraine war began, uh, which was February 2022. That, that index of commodities peaked in March of 2022. So they like to blame high oil prices or high food prices on the war. No, they'd already doubled before, before the war ever occurred. And when the war started, they went down. OK. But the Bloomberg's basically gone sideways for a year and a half, either side of 100 on the index, okay? Right now it's 103, okay? Uh, we have numbers that it's crossing this month that indicate that that pullback we've had since 2022 is over. We're going for another leg to the upside. Well, that's going to cause the Fed to what? They have to maintain their high rates, except it's a real pickle for them. Because if that stock market starts to break, and certain paper assets, and we also, let's say, a worsening of the uh, commercial real estate market, which so far hasn't turned into a crisis, but is likely to at some point. They, ha they have the other mandate, which is contradictory. They're really in a pickle. <laughs> and I, I know which way they're going to go. They're going to go for the soft money route. They have to. Uh, you know, otherwise, you know, they'll be laughed off the page. Uh, and gold knows that. And I, I think that's what's driving gold. As far as oil goes, it led, oil and natural gas led percent-wise among the commodities back in that two, late 2020 to early 2022 explosion, which we labeled, we pre-labeled it an explosion back in October 2020, by the way. Uh, they pretty much led that, but most markets went up at the same time. This time, I think, watch out, watch out for the grains. Uh, and they, they've got technical wherewithal to create quite a bit of dynamism on the upside. And I don't think people are expecting that. Well, of course, that's just what the Fed wants to see, higher food prices. Uh, that's what the public wants to see, right? Okay, it creates uncertainty, it creates fear. Uh, that won't help the stock market either. Uh, gold knows this. So I think we've got another wave of commodity upside coming. Oil will participate. I'm not sure it'll lead, though. I think the foods may, may surprise people. Uh, but uh, that's it's like 1970s, late 70s. Remember, commodities were explosive. Fed was even raising rates back then dramatically. Gold exploded. Stock market was a wasteland. OK, this time I think it's going to be stock market down, commodities up, but gold and silver up far more. I agree with the commercial real estate. I think that uh, I think we have yet to fully see the outcome of that. But what about, let's say, the, the private homeowner, uh, private real estate? How do you think this is going to fare when we start to have this meltdown? Well, it, it's, it, it's, this time it's more commercial, of course, than it was last time. It was residential real estate. But uh, the high rates are choking. And the longer the Fed just keeps them here, the, cho the choke gets even tighter and tighter. So, the, you know, what's a, a semi-alive body becomes a cadaver at some point. So a lot of the errors that have been committed 
based on the assumptions about the price of money being low and staying low. The longer they keep rates here, the more the choke effect. And home prices is one area, uh, you know, the, the, that marketplace. But there's also other areas where, where money has been committed based on the price of money being a factor. And it's causing that entity that made that decision to commit money and to borrow money, uh, it chokes them tighter and tighter as the months go by. And a lot of these loans are coming due now. You know, they were particularly in the next six months or so, as I understand it. Uh, and that create, helps create the crisis. So it's embedded in a lot of places. It's not just localized. And let's say like it was in, in 2007, eight, when the home real estate, it's, it's across the board. Uh, it was so long that we kept filling the tank at zero rates. And, and if you look at a Fed funds chart sometime and go back in history and see, it was like comatose at zero. I mean, that has consequences, okay? Errors are made and uh, we're, those errors will be unfolded. And as they become unfolded, it'll be panic and fear involved, including in the stock market. Yeah, it's a good way to put it. Errors were, were made. You think the Fed can correct these errors? Do you think they'll be able to, to right the ship, uh, bring down inflation, get people back to work, get the economy back on track, get businesses busy again? Or is it just too much damage, too much errors where we're, we're really heading off into a completely new direction? I think you're, I think you're going to have different, this is different this time than any other prior time. I think the political, social uh, turmoil consequences will be enormous. Uh, and the University of Virginia Department of Politics ran, had a poll back in October of last year. And I'll just relay it. And it echoes something we've been saying for a year. This, this outcome of this election will not be copacetic, no matter who wins. It will not be peaceful and copacetic. Their poll showed that... <clears throat> I, I don't have the data points in front of me right now, but an incredible double digit percent of both Democrats who would vote for Biden and Republicans who would vote for Trump felt that the other party, uh, if it won, violence would be justified. Whoa. It, it was like a, a near 20 percent on both sides. Uh, there was even discussion of the issue of secession. Would secession be justified if the other party won? And on the Republican side, it was, a, it was a hefty number. On the Democrat side, it was even a somewhat hefty number uh, where the blue states would separate. You know, So uh, the, the outcome of this coming election is not built into the market. Nobody's discussing it as, as a market variable. But when you create total political turmoil, and I think that's what we're facing, uh, there'll be consequences in the markets and in human emotion. And again, this is another factor underlying what gold's doing. Uh, it's going to be an interesting year, and I think a lot of it is not going to occur after the election, but before the election in terms of market dynamics. I, I'd have to agree with that. I, I do see a bit of a strife, to uh, to put it, I guess, nicely. A lot of strife coming our, our, our way with the elections coming up. Um, if it should do so, I, I have to imagine that no country really might want to hang on to, to, to a dollar from a perceived banana republic already at that point. Yeah, the dollar does look vulnerable to us technically. Right now, it's trading around just under one. It's in the one hundred threes dollar index now. Again, it's a distorted index. It's the euro upside down. Okay, uh, but it looks technically vulnerable such that if you drop about three percent or so, uh, it could it could you get back under a hundred again. Uh, it could it could cascade to the downside in a major way. Now we've had since uh, over the last forty years or so two major declines in the dollar index. I think the third one's about to begin. And uh, once it begins, that'll become another variable. But for, the, for example, since 2015, when gold made its low, the dollar index has actually risen about 4%. So you'd think if you look at the dollar, well, how can gold go up? Gold's more than doubled, and, dollar, and the dollar index is actually up. It was trading at 98 and change. It's now 103 and change. Okay, That's since December of 2015. But it looks to us like it could become a dynamic variable now. If it, if it breaks these momentum structures that we're looking at, such that it suddenly starts to become a game player. Uh, whereas, you know, the last, you know, 10 to eight or nine years, it's been, you know, this, this type of action. It could become dynamic, and, and then it becomes a, another variable in the mix. You know, getting back to, to what you said, you know, with the political turmoil, uh, geopolitical turmoil, we, we have a race to acquire resources. We, we have nations de-dollarizing a whole lot of, other things and, and more. 
Well, Michael, are, are we at a point where it seems like we're hitting the guardrails left, right, left, right? And, and you know, the world leaders and non-elected leaders, they seem to be pushing us somewhat in, into this uh, abyss where we're going to have to end up asking these same people that caused the damage. We're going to be asking them for, for help. I've made a speculative statement uh, in interviews before. It wouldn't surprise me in the next handful of years or maybe even sooner that we don't even have a Federal Reserve anymore. Which is, it's not like it's been there forever, okay? Uh, it's been around 100 years. And it's uh, even a lot of the friends of the Fed, economists who are, you know, like the central bank determining the price of money, you know, <laughs> and yet they call themselves free market. Uh, they're a little upset with the Fed, too. So it's not just the anti-Fed few economists, but the, the majority of economists are thinking, wow, the Fed's messing things up. And if things become uh, unbearable in the coming year, market forces and so forth, a lot of the blame is going to go to the Fed, and rightly so. And it wouldn't shock me that uh, in political turmoil that they get abolished at some point. You don't need a central bank. You don't, you know, it's like having the government price, uh, be, have, have a monopoly over the price of eggs Everybody's going to have eggs, right? Okay, so the government's going to price those eggs for us and determine the supply and demand of eggs. Well, you know, that's like the Soviet Union controlling prices and so forth. Uh, why do we have a monopoly over the price of money when we have, you know, we're supposed to allow free market exchange to determine price levels of various things? Money is an essential commodity. To have it controlled by government, <clears throat> people that, you know, aren't even in business you know, wouldn't even know how to run a convenience store, okay? And yet they're telling us what the price of money is supposed to be. Uh, it, it's easy easy for me to imagine that there'll be enough forces to say, huh, had enough of this, let's go to free market of money and maybe gold. A gold-backed currency has become dominant again. I cannot imagine a world without a central bank, but then again, the world that does have a central bank doesn't seem to be doing that well. So maybe the, the opposite is not such a bad idea. But Michael, for yourself, can you share with us the things that you are doing to put yourself in a better place for the outlook that, that we're talking about here that you're seeing? Well, I'm primarily focused on silver and the miners right now, the gold miners. They're, the gold miners in particular are vastly undervalued at any point in history compared to the price of gold, compared to like a GDX, compared to the S&P 500. They're off the page oversold. And we've had some <clears throat> major asset managers recently move out of the high tech stocks and into, uh, for instance, Stanley Druckenmiller. I think it was about six mid February. It was announced that he was selling a lot of big name tech stocks and buying Newmont and Barrick Gold. And I'm sure <clears throat> that at that time, th those stocks were near their lows at that point. Many other portfolio managers probably chuckled and smirked. <laughs> And uh, thinking, what an idiot, okay? Uh, uh, Newmont's now over 40. It was like 31 at that time, okay? So, you know, he, he's smiling. And I suspect there's other asset managers out there who are saying, hmm, what's going on here, you know? And uh, especially focused on the blue chips. But it's such a small, tiny sector in terms of total dollar value that any small movement of money out of the stock market into gold miners and silver miners would be like grabbing a wet bar of soap. So I'm focused primarily on, uh, I'm, I'm long calls on a GDX and SLV, which is the bullion ETF of silver. And, you know, going out six, eight months and at the money or in the money type calls, that's, that's my own personal uh, position. Again, I think the dynamics here will, what we've seen over the last like six, seven days in silver and gold have been very dramatic. I think expect that to continue over the next six months. Oh, there'll be an interruption in there somewhere. It'll be rude and crude, you know, a sharp sell off. But basically, it's something that could last, uh, you know, between now and the election. It could be quite a dynamic advance. And, and I'm focused on the what has been underperforming in that sector for the last couple of years at silver and the miners. I think they've now shifted relative to gold. All right, Michael Oliver, before we head on out, can you let the good people know? how they can follow you or contact you for your, your services and about your company. It's uh, OliverMSA.com, MSA for Momentum Structural Analysis. Uh, request some sample reports, be happy to send them. 
We cover all four major asset categories, the bond market, the foreign exchange, stock markets, and commodities with an emphasis on gold and silver. Michael, I appreciate your time and, and insight. Um, you, you gave us a, you painted a pretty good picture for us to, to kind of see the things that, that are coming ahead. So, so I appreciate that. And uh, like you said, you know, we'll, we'll have to uh, buckle up for that, that right ahead. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. That was Michael Oliver sharing his views on precious metals and the economy. To see more of Michael's views and work, please go to www.olivermsa.com. If you like this video, please do subscribe, share, and give it a thumbs up. All are greatly appreciated. Audio-only versions of this interview can be found on iTunes and Spotify.